Hello, welcome to the first edition of Until Ministries in 2024. We're glad that you are joining us. Well, I thought today it would be important if we looked at some scriptural strategies to help us through 2024. Uh, and these things are proven, uh, they're biblical, they're solid, and they've been lived out by many people. Uh, I think you'll really benefit. Um, I would encourage you to take notes at least on the four major points we're going to make to help us through 2024 in a Christ-like fashion. That's what we're all about. So God, we find that God's Word provides a formula to guide us and help us and encourage us as we begin the new year. So let's get right into it. The first point is, is that we need, going into 2024, we need to concentrate, concentrate on the perspective of the Lord. And for this, we have Philippians 3, 12 through 14, and Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. And I'm going to read those two for you briefly, and then we'll get into some development of the key ideas. Philippians 3, 12 through 14 says this. Paul's writing, and he's talking about his advancement in his growth in Christ, and he says, not that I have already obtained it or have already become mature, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, and here's the key phrase, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. Forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. He says, I press on. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And then Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, similar thought. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So here we see this concept of forgetting the past, and uh, the concept of encumbrances or things that hold us back. So they could be called baggage or encumbrances, old habits. They could be old habits. They could be problems. They could be failures. They could be grudges. So many people holding on to grudges today. They could be hurts of one kind or another. So those things should be just jettisoned. Leave them behind. Forget the things of the past. Also, this may surprise you, looking at our successes, we had some successes. Well, um, we're going to talk about a, a balance here in a moment, but um, if we don't forget to some degree our successes, uh, we can become complacent. And if we don't forget our failures, we can become discouraged. So as in so many instances of Scripture, there's a balance. So we need to learn, here's the balance now, and we should pray for this. We need to learn from our past mistakes and failures um, from 2023 and before, but don't wallow in them. Don't beat yourself up over mistakes you made or failures you had this past year or any time in your past. Um, learn from them. Learn from your mistakes. Don't forget the lessons. Don't forget the good points that you can learn from them. But don't waller in your failures or your shortcomings. Uh, otherwise, you'll be discouraged. Don't beat yourself up, we would say. Be grateful, on the other hand, for your victories and successes I'm not saying you shouldn't be grateful for what the Lord's allowed you to achieve, but 
any, if you're a Christian watching this, if you're someone who has received Christ as your personal Savior, He's forgiven your sin, He lives in your heart by your invitation, and you're living for Him, and you've had successes and, fi- uh, successes and victories, don't take credit for them because the credit belongs to God. Anything that you achieve, any credit goes to God, not to yourself. And uh, we should not take the credit. We should not be prideful or complacent. So here's that balance. Be victory for, be grateful for the victories and successes. Learn from them and so on. But don't take the credit and don't become prideful or complacent. And then Paul says, press forward to what lies ahead. And then we look at the Hebrews, uh, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 as well. Running the race of the Christian life day by day. Whoever the author is of Hebrews um, says the same thing. Run the race of the Christian life day by day. And Paul, the author of Philippians, is saying, run that race, go forward, uh, press forward, he says, to what lies ahead. Going for that goal, that high calling of Jesus Christ. There's a high calling and a goal for each one of us who know Jesus as our Savior. And that goal is complete Christ-likeness through the power of the Holy Spirit. You can't do it on your own, certainly. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, you and I can be more Christ-like in 2024 than we were in 2023. And by the way, if you're watching or listening and you've never committed your life to Christ, 2024 would be a great time to start. Receive Christ as your Savior, uh, confess that He's the Son of God, confess that you know He died for your sin on the cross and rose from the dead, and then ask Him to come into your life and forgive your sin and to take over your life and be your Lord and Savior. So concentrate on the perspective of the Lord. That's point number one. Secondly, we need to commit our thoughts to the Lord. And for this, we see Philippians 4, verses 1, 4, and 8, and 2 Corinthians 10, 5, and also Ephesians 5, 15, and 16. So I'll read those verses for us. Philippians 4, 1 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and my crown in this way, stand firm in the Lord, rejoice in the Lord always, Again, I will say rejoice. Uh, and then going down to verse 8, which is, is important uh, when we're talking about our thoughts. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence and anything worthy of prayer, worthy of praise, dwell on these things. In other words, think the things that are right. Think the things that are true, that are honorable, that are pure. Your thoughts and my thoughts should be pure. They should be lovely. They should be of good repute and worthy of praise. And that's where our minds should dwell. And 2 Corinthians 10, 5 says an interesting phrase. It says that we should take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Take every thought captive. Capture every thought and make sure that it is along the lines of obedience to Christ. So our thought life is so important and our thoughts should be consistent with obedience to Christ. And then Ephesians 5, 15 and 16 says, Therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So our thoughts should be wise because the days are evil and we need to make the most of our time. And so the second point of committing our thoughts to the Lord, it's talking about priorities in our thinking. The first priority, as we read in Philippians, is to rejoice. That means your thoughts should find your chief joy in the Lord, putting him first in your life, centering your life on him. That is the key. Rejoice in the Lord. That It means to find your chief joy, to find your chief delight in life, to find it in the Lord, 
not in your achievements, not in your possessions, not in your job, not in anything but the Lord. Find your chief joy in the Lord. Make him your top priority. Put him first. Center your thoughts on him. Make him the focus of your life. That's the best advice I can give you for 2024 and the best advice I can give myself. Stand firm in your biblical beliefs. The Bible has been under attack for thousands of years, and guess what? It still prevails, and guess what? It's still 100% accurate. It's 100% reliable. It's your guide, should be your guide, to all matters of life is the scriptures. Uh, regardless of the opposition, regardless of people ridiculing and making fun, the Bible stands, it has for thousands of years, and it always will. And then uh, another priority in our thinking, I, I think, is to be driven to make a difference. Be driven to make a difference in your life, in your place of work, in your family, um, in your church, uh, in your neighborhood, wherever you are, in your social groups, uh, <clears throat> in your leisure time associations. Be driven to make a difference for Christ. Be driven to make an impact. Uh, one of my favorite uh, writers is Max Licato. Many of you have heard of him. Some of you have read his things. But this is from his devotional called, called God is With You Every Day. And he says this. <clears throat> he says, Today I will make a difference. I will begin by controlling my thoughts. And then he says, optimism will be my companion and victory will be my hallmark. Today I may, will make a difference. I will be grateful for the 24 hours that are before me. Uh, while it is here, I will use it for loving and giving. Today I will make a difference. See his thoughts? The thoughts, he's committing his thoughts to the Lord. Listen to this now. He says, I will not let past failures haunt me. Even though my life is scarred with mistakes, I refuse to rummage through my trash heap of failures. I will admit them. I will correct them. I will press on victorious. No failure is fatal. It's okay to stumble. I will get up. It's okay to fail. I will rise again. Today, I will make a difference. You see, you got that thought life to start your day. Today, I will make a difference. Today, I'll make an impact for Christ. I will spend time with those I love. Today, I will make a difference. I cut a lot of that out, but I think you get the idea. The thought life is so important, as Max says here. Uh, if you go into your day saying, I want to be more Christ-like today. I want to make a difference for Christ. I want to make an impact for Christ. And uh, we go forward with that positive attitude, uh, makes such a difference. The thought life is important because it develops into a pattern. Um, it, there's an established pattern, um, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But if we allow the Holy Spirit to control our lives with godly thinking, it will make a tremendous difference in your life, a tremendous difference to have Holy Spirit-controlled, godly thinking. You see, uh, this is why it's important. There's a thought, and if we dwell on a thought, that becomes an action. If you dwell on a thought long enough, it's going to become an action. And then that action is going to become a habit, and that habit is going to form your character, and that character is going to form your destiny. It all starts, so your destiny started with a thought. Thought, if you dwell on it, becomes an action, then a habit, then a character, then a destiny. And that can be a good thought or a bad thought. So if you have a bad thought and you dwell on it, it's going to bring a bad action, eventually a bad habit, a bad character, a bad destiny. But if you have positive, Holy Spirit-controlled, Christ-centered thoughts, and you dwell on that, then you're going to have Christ-like actions, Christ-like habits, Christ-like character, Christ-like destiny. You see, the thought life is so important. And that's why our second point today, 
Commit your thoughts to the Lord is very, very important. There's a huge battle for the mind out there. Did you know that? Um, if, you, if you see television or you listen to radio or uh, you, have, you hear advertisements or you hear people talking around you and so on, there's just a huge battle for your mind. Uh, the internet, um, all, all the social media. There's a battle for your mind. So you got to run, run everything you see or hear, including what I say. you got to run it through the sifter of God's word. I'm never going to, un, un, until ministries, I am never going to tell you something that I cannot back up 100% with scripture. If I give you something that's an opinion and I can't back it with scripture, I will say so. I'll say, this is how I feel about such and such. Um, that's not coming from scripture. That's how I feel. But everything I say in a sermon, I can back with scripture. And that's why I have the references on the screen. That's why I uh, announce the references for those listening on the radio. So this battle through the mind, through the internet and through social media and for, through television and the printed matter and everything, you got to run it through the sifter because there's a lot of people out there telling you stuff that's just plain not true. Did you know that? There's a lot of people out there that are passing off garbage that's just plain not true. So you run it through the sifter of God's word and then repeating what we saw in Philippians 4, verse 8, whatever's true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, whatever is excellent, whatever is worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on those things. And those thoughts will become actions and habits and character and destiny. Very good. So now let's move to our third point, which is cast your burdens upon the Lord. Cast your burdens upon the Lord. And for this, we'll look at Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. That whole fourth chapter of Philippians is just a wonderful, wonderful chapter. Read it when you can on your own time. Uh, Philippians 4, 6 through 7, um, and Psalm 55, 22, and 1 Peter 5, 7 saying basically the same things, but I'm going to read them all because the word of God is what's so important. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Incidentally, um, according to research, this is uh, one of the most beloved and one of the best known passages of scripture. Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Memorize it if you haven't done so already. It says, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So we're not to be, no, we're not to have anxiety or to be worried or be fretting, but we're to go to prayer uh, with thanksgiving. And let God know what our requests are. Don't worry. Don't be anxious. Just take your request to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So cast your burdens on the Lord. Don't carry it yourself. Don't worry and be anxious yourself. Psalm 55, 22 says it well. It says, Cast your burden along, upon the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. So you have a burden, you have a problem, you have a heavy load, cast it on the Lord and he will sustain you. Cast your burden upon the Lord, Psalm 55, 22. And then 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Cast all your anxiety and cares upon him because he cares for you. Same idea, right? Cast your anxiety and your cares on him because he cares for you. So the procedure that these verses are talking about, um, it's Holy Spirit empowered. So this is not something you could do it on your own. Holy Spirit empowered. It's, the procedure is don't worry 
or have anxiety about anything, but pray about everything. You see that? Don't worry or have anxiety about anything, but pray about everything. That's what it says, and that's something that don't... He says, well, I can't help worrying. Well, I can't help worrying either. But the Holy Spirit can give us the power not to worry or be anxious, but to pray about everything. Don't worry, have worry or anxiety about anything. Pray about everything. And with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. Thank you, Lord, that this challenge is in my life. Thank you that this burden or problem is in my life, Lord, because I know you're going to use it for my good somehow. I thank you for it, Lord, but now I'm requesting that you resolve this issue or you help me through this rough spot. You get me to the other side. That's what it's all about. And then that's the procedure. And then the peace, the peace is also Holy Spirit produced. And it's more, it says here that the peace is more wonderful than the human mind can understand. So you've probably known people who are close to the Lord who go through a terrible, terrible trial or tribulation, and they just seem calm, and they just seem at peace. And we say, gee, I can't understand how this person is so peaceful or so calm. It's because undoubtedly they've given it to the Lord in prayer, and they're letting the Lord bear their burden. And he promises to guard our hearts and minds against further worry and anxiety. It becomes a habit, if you will, to pray, turn it over to the Lord, and then he guards our hearts and minds down the road against further worry or anxiety. So our third point then is cast your burdens upon the Lord. Now, our final point today is conduct yourself in the love of the Lord. Conduct yourself in the love of the Lord. And for this, we'll look at, again, Philippians 4, this time verses 1 through 5 and 9 through 19, and 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 13, which is the love chapter, which we won't have time to read all of it today, but many of you are familiar with it. Um, these are the verses that will help us conduct ourselves in the love of the Lord. And so... Um, let's look at, first of all, what it is. And again, let me emphasize, none of us, myself included, not even the greatest preachers or missionaries that ever lived, um, and you take a person like Billy Graham, who is arguably uh, the greatest evangelist that ever lived, and he'd be, he's with the Lord now, has been for a few years, but he'd be the first to tell you that he couldn't do this on his own. He needed the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who empowers us if we will let him control us. So what we're talking about here is a life conducting ourselves in the love of the Lord. It, what results is patience. Boy, I don't know about you, but I sure need patience. Uh, patience, kindness, forgiveness, trusting. These are all things that are produced by the Holy Spirit. Honesty, integrity, hope, never giving up, never failing. These are all things that are coming by conducting ourselves in the power of the Holy Spirit in the love of the Lord. That's how the love of the Lord manifests itself through our lives. And you say, well, I still don't see how I can do this. Well, the Holy Spirit will empower you, but in this section of Philippians, Philippians 4.13, an easy verse to memorize, um, a key verse in Scripture, so important. It says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Did you hear that? I'm sure you've memorized that verse or have heard it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can't do anything on my own, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And then verse 11 in this passage says that we are to be content regardless of circumstances. To be content regardless of circumstances. Paul says, I've learned to be content in all situations whether I'm rich or poor, 
whether I'm in prison or I'm free, whether I'm shipwrecked, whether I'm being beaten, no matter what's happening to me, I can be content. Why? Because he's conducting himself in the love of the Lord. And then verse 19 in Philippians chapter 4 says to trust the Lord in the sense that he will provide all our needs. Philippians 4.19 says that my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. That's a promise. But let me tell you that, that, that Jesus' promise to supply all our needs, he never promises to supply all our wants or our desires or our lusts. He promises to meet all our needs, but it's in the context of giving to others. In other words, if we're willing to help meet the needs of others, the Lord says, I'll meet all your needs according to the, my Father's riches and glory in Christ Jesus. What a promise that is. Um, then what conducting yourself in love of the Lord, again, this is coming from 1 Corinthians 13. Please read that passage. Um, it says here what it isn't. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 13, the love chapter, it does tell what love is, and we've discussed a few of those things. It also tells what love isn't. Love isn't jealous. Love isn't boastful. Love isn't arrogant. Love isn't selfish. Love isn't rude. Love isn't irritable. Love doesn't insist on its own way. Love is not unforgiving. Love is never unjust. So love doesn't insist on its own way. It's not unforgiving. It's not unjust. But love is patient and kind, as we were talking about earlier. It's forgiving and trusting and hopeful and, and honest. And it's never giving up and never failing. Can you imagine what kind of world we would have in 2024 if everybody lived by 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 13, and we were patient and kind and understanding and forgiving and never jealous or boastful or arrogant or selfish or rude or irritable or insist on our own way or unforgiving and unjust. So we need to conduct ourselves in the love of the Lord. So let's look at those four just as we close once again. First of all, we need to concentrate on the perspective of the Lord. Secondly, commit our thoughts to the Lord. Third, we need to cast our burdens on the Lord, cast all our worries and anxiety on the Lord. And fourth, conduct ourselves in the love of the Lord. And when Christ's love controls us, we will be Christ-like people. God bless you. Thank you for watching. See